it's, it's remarkable to see you all here. This place is, is absolutely full, which is very cool. And I see community members here. I see faculty members. The faculty are, are easy to find because they're looking really serious. The, the freshmen are easy to find because if you just look at the freshmen, they just smile when you look at them. Look at this, right? <laughs> see? You're giggling. I just looked at you and you giggled. <laughs> Don't stare at the freshmen, please. Um, but th this is precisely um, why we're all here and why we, why we did this. This is our sixth year of, of this common book event. Um, I want you to appreciate just how, how challenging and interesting it is to, to put together a committee around a, a single task, which is to find a book that will bring together community a single book that people can hold in their, in their hands that will inspire ideas, inspire us to think, perhaps bring us together around a talk, maybe even form community. Um, when freshmen were coming in, I saw them sitting um, in the lawns. I saw them sitting up at Husky Stadium with Richard Feynman's book in their hand. And that's precisely the point, to come to events like, like this, to form community around I ideas. This year, the committee chose um, Feynman's books, The Meaning of It All, Thoughts of a Citizen Scientist by this Nobel Laureate winning physicist. And what a fascinating choice in light of the other selection that we've, we've chose from the beginning. The first year was, was Mountains Beyond Mountains, a book about Paul Farmer, written by Tracy Kidder. And we invited both Tracy Kidder and Paul Farmer here and had a wonderful, wonderful talk. Fascinating. The next year, we invited Elizabeth Colbert around a book called Field Notes from a Catastrophe about climate change. Last year, we, the, the committee chose a selection of, of poems. We were talking about poetry last year on this stage. And this year, we're talking about a little bit of everything and to include science, art, magic. It's a chance to bring faculty together. And a chance to tie to a theme. This is our sesquicentennial at the university, our 150th year. And when the committee came together and chose this book, it was a chance to tie back to um, a series of lectures in 1963 where Professor Feynman came and spoke. And so this book is a compilation of, of lectures of Feynman himself. It is a fascinating read, and it's a little bit of Feynman. It is curious. It is smart. It's a little egocentric, just like all of us. Um, I look forward to this talk tonight. I, <laughs> you're going to learn how to lie. You're going to learn how to cheat. And you're going to learn how to steal. And, and if we do this right, maybe you'll learn a little magic as well. So welcome. Thank you, Shelby. Thanks, Ed. We're so excited to have Dr. Diaconis with us tonight. One of the things about a place like the UW is that you have an opportunity to hear from a range of leading thinkers on different topics. And then you can even ask them questions. And since this year's Common Books theme is so much centered around questioning, after the talk, there's going to be some time for all of you to ask questions of Dr. Diaconis. So think of questions throughout the talk. Today, Dr. Percy Diaconis is the Mary V. Sonseri Professor of Statistics and Mathematics at Stanford University. But when he was 14, he left home to learn magic and from and travel with the sleight of hand legend Di Vernon. I imagine that was pretty interesting. Heard some good stories in the green room about those times. So, um, but at that point, he wanted to read a book on probability theory, but he didn't understand the math in the book. He vowed to return to school and learn math so that he could understand this book. He might be the only person in the world to run away from the circus to join a school. So it's pretty interesting. He went on to earn his undergraduate degree from the City College of New York and his PhD in mathematical statistics from Harvard University. He used mathematical principles to debunk physics and hamper a Caribbean casino that was allegedly using shaved dice to benefit the house. In his research, he often brings an interdisciplinary approach to issues of probability, factoring in the physics of a coin flip, for example, to determine the chance of it landing in the same way it began. He incorporates magic into mathematics to explain simple questions. The answers he finds can sometimes unravel what we thought we knew about probability and chance. He received the MacArthur Genius Award and has written several papers on randomness and probability. 
And although he is here tonight to talk about the search for randomness, there is nothing random about how glad we are that he's here to speak. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Percy Diaconis. Hi. Speaking in the shadow or the glory of, of Feynman is just wonderful. I was, uh, didn't know this little book. I, I read Feynman both high and low. Surely you're joking, but also technical papers and, and carry it here as the Bible. Uh, you, you can find um, lots of different things in Feynman. Uh, that, and I am do probability and statistics. And so I was reading, and I found lots of references to things that I'm interested in. Maybe as you read along, these will sing out to you. One of the things he said is, all of the things we say in science, uh, all of the conclusions are uncertain. Later, it is of paramount importance in order to make progress that we recognize this ignorance and this doubt. Because we have this doubt, we can then propose looking for new ideas. He then gets a little bit more quantitative, and uh, there's one thing to say, I don't know anything, and there's another thing to say this. Um, there are two sources of difficulty that the young man we are imagining would have. I think when he, when he studies science. The first is that he learns to doubt, that it is necessary to doubt, that it is valuable to doubt. So he begins to question everything. The question might have been before, is there a God or isn't there a God? He's not taking any prisoners. He's right after it. And uh, that question changes to, how sure I, am I that there's a God? He now has a new and subtle problem that is different than it was before. He has to determine how sure he is, where on the scale between absolute certainty and absolute uh, certainty on the other side he can put his belief, because he knows that he has to have his knowledge in an unsure condition. <laughs> And he cannot be absolutely certain anymore. He has to make up his mind. Is it 50-50 or is it 97%? This sounds like a very small difference, but it is an extremely important and subtle difference. So how do you think about uncertainty? And that's what I'm going to talk to you about tonight. Uh, this talk is called The Search for Randomness. I've got this thing. <laughs> it's good. And, and, and what I'm going to do is to talk as openly as you can in public about the foundations of my subject, the, the roots of it. Uh, and for me, uh, one of the primordial examples of a random phenomena is that. That is, if you flip a coin in your own hand, your coin, and you, you know, do that, heads or tails, that seems like 50-50. To, to most people. And I mean, it's a, it's a primitive image of randomness. And we would often understand what are the chances of something else in terms of, well, it's like flipping, flipping a coin. Now, I'm going to talk about flipping a coin for a while. So what about that? Um, uh, here's a question that Feynman could have asked. Um, when I flip a coin, it goes up at a certain speed, and it turns over a certain number of revolutions per second. If I knew how fast it was going up and how many times a second it was turning, Newton tells me whether it comes up heads or tails. So is coin tossing random, or is it physics? And that's a question. I mean, that's sort of... Well, I want to claim that it's physics. And to make that point, I had um, my physics department build me a coin tossing machine. Um, and I used to bring it along to talks, but it's a kind of awkward gadget. It takes about two hours to set up. And when you go through airport security now, what's that? <laughs> it's a coin tossing. OK, so I'm sorry you'll have to look at it this way. But there it is. It's about this big. And a coin goes in there. That's what it looks like. And uh, uh, then I turn that ratchet, and, and the coin goes ping up that way, sparing no expense. I don't know, it must have taken 70 shots to get that edge on. See that there? That's what, what it looks. The coin just spins up just the way it looked on my, um, when I was doing it there. And then the coin lands in the cup. Ta-da! 
Only it always comes up the same way. And so you do it heads, you do it heads, you know, 100 out of 100 heads. It's very, very disturbing viscerally. You know, this <laughs> seems random and it's heads all the time. Now, of course, if you think about it, the coin is being hit with the same force at the same position. It's got to do the same thing. So coin tossing is physics, it's not random. So for a second, I'm going to look at the physics a little bit. This isn't. Here's, here's some physics. Uh, <laughs> when, when the coin goes up this way, it's traveling at a certain speed, and it's got a certain how many times a second it's turning. And each flip, therefore, corresponds to a, 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 a speed and a how many times a second it's turning. And if I, I can make a graph on a picture like that, where this axis is velocity, uh, how fast it's going, and omega is how many times a second it's turning. And so, for example, that red point there, which is kind of high on velocity but low on omega, the coin is going up like a pizza. Okay? And then it, you can imagine if a coin went up like a pizza, it doesn't turn over at all. Right? It just goes up like a pizza. And so there's a region there where the coin doesn't turn over at all, and, and up there, there the coin has tremendous rotation number, but it just didn't get very much oomph, so it also doesn't turn over. There's a region where the coin doesn't turn over at all, and that's bounded by a hyperbola, and uh, you, can, you can write down what it is. And then there's another region where it turns over exactly once and exactly twice, et cetera. So now here's what that picture looks like for grown-up. <laughs> this is the phase space of of a coin being tossed. Now the first thing you might notice about this picture is that up there, the, the stripes, so there it turns over no times, one time, you know, two times, three times, so even and odd, so it comes up heads or tails. Up there, the stripes are getting closer and closer together. So small changes in the initial conditions make for the difference between heads and tails, and everybody kind of knows that. Uh, and and that, that helps to and just explain why you have to be pretty good with your thumbs to uh, uh, control it. Okay. Um, so there's a question. When we flip a real coin, like this coin, where are we on that picture? That's a, that's a question. So there's two parts to that question. Uh, first is, how fast is it going, and how many times a second is it turning out? How fast is it going? That's not so bad. I got a friend with a stopwatch. You know, one, two, three, flip. You're sort of clicking and, you know, flipping. And if, if I know how long it takes to go up and down, I can translate that into how, how fast is it going. Um, and so we had a number for that. The other question I like to talk about, because people have ideas, and I'm sure I'll learn something. Um, when I do that, when you do that, how many times is it turning? Is it turning seven times? Is it turning 80 times? Some place maybe in between. You know, it's not so easy to think about. Um, so I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll get a high-speed slow-motion uh, camera, and I'll, um, you know, I'll just do it. So I went to the Unit went all over the university, and I wanted a high-speed slow-motion camera that would capture a coin being flipped. You have to shoot at about 1,000 frames a second to do that. And at the time, there was one camera on Stanford's campus which would shoot at 1,000 frames a second, and it was owned by our football team. <laughs> and they had a one-week period during the summer before the team came back where they would allow me to use the camera, but I had to hire their operator, and it would be about $2,000 a day. I wanted to know the number, but I didn't want to know it that badly. Um, uh, then I had a first idea, which was um, paint half of the coin black, half of the coin white, <clears throat> get a friend with a tunable stroboscope, blink, 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 and then have him adjust, and I flip the coin, and he adjusts. So seven or eight hours later, it, it never freezes. It's kind of complicated what coins do, do but we we had some idea. And then I had my first good technical idea. Okay, here it is, brought to you. Just explain this. This is an American half dollar with, I hope, uh, eventually, some 
how stuck together could it have, could it have become? There we are. It's got dental floss on it, in case you were wondering, right? And this is the new kind of dental floss that's flat. So I flatten it out like that. There it is, flat. There, it's flat. Oop. I don't want to do that. There it is. There is Kennedy, face up, and it's flat. I do that, and then I unravel it until it's flat again, and I can tell how many times it... Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, okay, by hook and by crook, we had a pretty good idea of how coins go. <laughs> and uh, I want to tell you the answers um, for a second. Um, uh, from experimentation, a, a one foot toss or so, that, well, that's a little more, but it takes about half a second. Um, and that means the coin's going up about five and a half uh, miles per hour. Using the tunable strobe and with the ribbon and that stuff, um, a coin, when you flip it, is, is turning over at something between, say, 35 and 40 revolutions per second. Now, it's only going up for half a second, so that means it's turning over, well, you know, something between you know, 18 and 20. That's not so, many, so much variation, 18, 19, 20. It's not, it's pretty set in there, right? It's not so, so wild. And uh, um, so I kind of know where I am. Now, going back to this picture, I have some data. W where does that put me on the picture? Well, uh, in the units of this picture, <laughs> um, this is the velocity, uh, the, how fast it's going is uh, a fifth. So, there's five, there's one, a fifth. It's pretty close to zero. But it's 40 units up. <laughs> so this picture says nothing about real coin tossing, but the math behind the picture tells you how serrated the lines are up there. And there's a real sense in which, I mean, a provable sense, uh, in a practical sense, in which coins flip the way we normally flip them are slightly biased to come up the way they started. Slightly, if they started heads, they're slightly biased to come up heads again. And the bias is about 0.51, uh, so about 1 in 100. That's a small bias. It would take you about a quarter of a million flips to detect that in real experiments. But every year at the Super Bowl time, ESPN calls and say, could we get you to do a minute about whether the Super Bowl toss is fair or not? And I have ducked in the last few years, but who knows? Um, uh, I want to uh, abstract a little bit where does randomness come from. And this image that I'm about to explain is about as clear as I can say for me for where randomness comes from. So imagine that that wall was painted black and white and I was standing there, I'll stand here, sort of, okay. And then I actually had a dart, so that's black, that's white, and I'm not great with darts, but I could mostly get it into the black, sure. Um, and, or maybe if I could maybe stand a little closer, get it mostly into the white. So there's nothing terribly random. And now imagine that the paint on the wall was rearranged so that instead of being that panel is black and that panel is white, they're one foot by one foot. I'm not bad, but I'm not good. Suppose they go down, they're one inch by one inch. Black, white, black, white, black, white, black, white. It's random, right, where it, whether it's black or white when it hits the wall, right? So you could see the randomness coming in. Uh, I want to, that, that's such a, a common cause that is un the tiniest little uncertainty about the initial conditions get magnified into making something random. I want to make math out of that for a second. Um, this is a picture that's supposed to mirror my, the angle that I toss that dart in. So the height of that curve is the propensity for the dart to come where the curve is high and where the curve is low. My, it's not so likely that I'll toss the dart there. There's some curve, my aim, uh, uh, where the dart wants. Under the curve, it's, um, it's labeled, say, red or black. 
And a, a wonderful mathematician, Henri Poincaré, proved as a theorem, now it's sort of intuitively obvious, that as that ruling gets finer and finer, the chance that it's one color or another tends to a half. This is essentially the only math in the talk. If you're allergic, put your fingers in your ears. Um, <laughs> it's, 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 it's not very much. Proof. <laughs> I've got my density. I have to figure out what is the area above the red pieces. How does that differ from the area above the white pieces? That's what I wrote down there. These symbols say that is the difference between the propensity for the dart landing at x to the propensity of the dart landing at x plus h. If the propensity function is a nice continuous function, uh, that's bounded by what's called the modulus of continuity, sorry for using bad words, and um, it's a property of continuous functions that that tends to zero as h goes to zero. If you're a grown-up sitting here, uh, it's also true without assuming continuous because translation is continuous in L1. Now, if you want to ever know what that means, go take some math courses. Okay, enough of that. <laughs> we can sharpen that to make a quantitative bound. The chance of red differs from a half by how wide, how far apart things are, h, times this measure of wiggliness. The derivative measures how sharply peaked the function is. And you have to put something like that in, because I might be a professional dart player and get pretty good at throwing the dart where I want. But as the ruling gets finer and finer, the chance of red or black goes to a half. No matter how accurate you are, that's what this says. This idea of quantifying the approach to randomness is called the method of arbitrary functions. It was invented by Poincaré, and it was brilliantly developed by Eberhard Hopf, um, who treated all kinds of problems um, that way. Now, rather than tell you any more math, I want to tell you some stories. We <laughs> um, can put them all down so we can all see them together. The same kind of analysis can be applied to any image of randomness. So roulette. Um, here's a story from the trenches. When I started teaching at Stanford, um, we had the idea, you know, roulette is a physical game. Probably most of you know roulette, there's a, 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 an outer wheel, a ball gets spun on the outer wheel, it goes around like that. There's an inner wheel with 38 numbers on it, numbers 1 to 36, plus 0, plus double 0, that gets spun the other way. The ball drops down, and it lands in one of the pockets. And if you bet on the right number, you, you win. Roulette's a physical game. Uh, and they let you bet pretty late at roulette. <laughs> and so we had the idea we could clock the wheel and try to figure out where the ball is going to you know, drop. And so we built a gadget, kind of a little like a cigar package. And um, it worked like this. Um, the croupier throws the ball. When the ball passes a fixed point on the wheel, we tap a switch on our arm or something. You don't sit there with a the little computer, you know. And, and, and then the, the gadget knows the ball just went by. It comes around again. You tap, and the gadget knows. So now the gadget knows how fast the ball is going. You do the same for the inner wheel. Tap, tap. The, bad, the gadget knows how fast the inner wheel is going. And then the gadget figures out where the ball's going to land. It's only right to within half a wheel. <laughs> if you're getting 35 to 1 on an 18 to 1 shot, it's like having a vacuum cleaner in the casino. Okay? I mean, <laughs> uh, one thing we learned is that casinos don't like it when you start hitting <laughs> numbers. If you put $25 chips on a number and you hit a couple of times, they really don't like it. And, uh, when we were building the gadget, uh, we, I rented a roulette wheel. We very carefully leveled it. We'd done all the physics, so we, you know, how do you program the gadget? And we tried it out. And all the equations didn't work at all. And one of the things I did, as I did with the coin, is we had neglected friction. There's three kinds of friction. There's rolling friction, there's sliding friction, and there's air friction. And the friction that really mattered was air friction. 
So when they turned on the air conditioners, all of the equations changed, right? It, it wasn't a waste of time uh, because we knew the shape of the equations and we just had to tune a few parameters. And so what we did is go to the casinos, watch for half an hour, tune the exact parameters, it's a little bit of a use of statistics, and then we, we got we got pretty, pretty good. <laughs> if you want to um, read about this, um, uh, we made money with it, uh, and so we <laughs> didn't write a book, but um, <laughs> there was a group at Santa Cruz that never got their act together, so they did write a book. The book is pretty good. It's called The Eudaimonic Pie. Eudaimonus was one of Aristotle's good demons, and uh, uh, I knew that they'd actually done it, I actually know the guys who wrote the book, uh, when they said, you know, there's three kinds of friction, sliding, rolling, and air friction really matters. I said, oh, they tried it. Okay, that's good. There is one other thing I want to do, which is this. It's one of the reasons I like this transparency projector. There's another way of flipping a coin, and it's this. Okay, you know, spinning it on its edge. No, that doesn't show so well, but it was, oh, that's good. So it's a coin spun on its edge. So if somebody asked you, you know, what are the odds that a coin spun on its edge comes up heads or tails? I don't know. There's a right answer to that question. You don't know. Because <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> it turns out anything like 50 50 is way, way off. Um, coins spun on their edge have very, very distinctive biases. When I was a kid, I learned that. 64D pennies spun on their edge come up tails 80% of the time when spun on a pool table. You know, you could make money from somebody. <laughs> um, it has to do in a very delicate way with where the center of gravity is. It works better with coins with unmilled edges. Pennies and nickels are more biased than, than others. Here's some data uh, that I, I gathered. Um, uh, this is, I had a class of 103 kids. Uh, and I tortured them. Uh, uh, first exercise was find a penny and toss it a uh, hundred times. So that's a lot of times to toss a penny. And all of the kids tossed a penny. And tell me how many heads you got. And this is a histogram. And what you can see, it's about 50, but then plus or minus you know, something. And that's just what 50-50 coin tosses should be this kind of a coin toss. Then I had them take the same penny and spin it on their, their, their edge, and then I collected the pennies. Okay? And uh, this is the spinning data. So each kid spun the coins 100 times. And a given coin has its own bias, but for example, here, uh, out of 100 kids, you know, five or so had, had, a, had a, a coin that came up, uh, I guess that's uh, 90 tails. Tails is comes up more than heads uh, in, in spun coins for some reason. Uh, but, but you know, 90% of the time it, it came up tails. Well, that's pretty biased, right? Now, I'm going to combine these things. Here's a question. If somebody had asked you this before, are you going to that talk? What do you think the odds are about this? One guy says, I'm going to, you know, you're going to do this. I'm not cheating. Um, uh, flip a coin in the air. That's one thing. The second thing it could be is that flip a coin in the air, let it land on the floor. Which is fairer? Now, before this talk, you would have said, is that a question? Does it have an answer? Could it have an answer? Most people, when asked, and I've asked, um, think that coins tossed on the floor are fairer. I'd like to suggest that's because when a coin is caught in the hand, there's a hand there. And you think maybe something could happen. You know, so let's rule that out. You're tossing the coin at home. You're not looking. You don't catch it. OK. Which is fairer? Well, having watched a lot of coins, when a coin hits the ground, before it dies, it spins around a little on its edge. And some of that edge stuff comes up. So there's a real sense in which coins caught in the hand are fairer than coins tossed on the ground. <laughs> What's that F? So. To be honest for a moment, uh, I lied to you. I said I was going to explain randomness. And if you listen carefully, when I got down to it, F, which was, you know, was the propensity of the, it was sort of the probability of the dart landing someplace. So it's, there really is a sense in which you can't get probability out without putting probability in. But what is that F? What, what is it, actually? Well, Poincaré, who invented the theory, 
He just didn't care about philosophy, so he didn't worry about it. Hopf said something which a lot of people like, um, and it, it, it went like this. Um, uh, if, I, if I toss the dart a lot, it's going to get darker in some parts of the line than others. If I flip the coin a lot, and each time on my phase diagram I put a dot, the velocity and the spin, the dots will be bigger some places and less, less, less dark other places. Hop thought you have this data and then you, you make a histogram out of it and then you, F is a continuous smooth approximation to the long-term frequency of the initial conditions. Uh, and that's okay. Um, it's okay. But uh, the problem is the argument I gave, uh, the careful analysis I gave, the analysis seems right for one flip. You know, I don't need to talk about repeating endlessly. Also, if you try to think about how I can use anything about probability to talk about you know, more interesting things, like is it going to be raining when we leave the building, or does she love me or does she love me not? I mean, any real application of uncertainty, and there are every part of life, the notion of I have to embed my life and the present circumstances in some imaginary long-term frequency is gaga for me. And uh, on the other hand, we do have uncertainty in everything we, we have, and uh, we, we do. And, and is there a way of dealing with uncertainty where things can't be repeated? And there is a way, and I'm not going to tell you very much about it, but at least I'll say the magic words. Um, it's called subjective probability, and uh, Bruno De Finetti, uh, Frank Ramsey, Jimmy Savage, and I uh, think that probability represents, is best thought of, as representing a person's degree of knowledge or uncertainty uh, for observables. So the way I think about it, coins don't have little numbers probability written inside them. They have force, they have mass, and coefficients of restitution, and centers of gravity, and things that you can measure, but they don't have little probability. People have probability. <laughs> uh, so if you, you know I'm a very, you could guess that I'm a very experienced coin tosser. If you had to you know, assign odds to yourself or me, by your knowledge, you, you might very well think that, you know, this guy is going to get 10 heads in a row, whereas I'm probably not going to get 10 heads in a row. That is, what you know about the circumstances and situations have to be, you know, go into the calculations. Well, it seems like a tall order, but it's not. Um, and uh, the uh, using notions of coherence, uh, and uh, exchangeability, there's a very beautiful theory uh, that captures what's useful, I find it captures what's useful for me in making probability calculations, and it pr protects us from silliness. Uh, as you'll hear in a minute, it's, it's possible to invoke probability and randomness and do the silliest things. And, and I find that thinking, this is supposed to be my opinion, you mean? Hmm. Uh, uh, that's not my opinion or anybody's opinion. I find that this subjective world helps me. So here's my answer uh, to a Bayesian answer uh, to what is F. Um, F is my best guess uh, um, for uh, the next, for example, pair. So suppose Ed pops up right now and he's got a water pistol. And uh, he says, all right, Diaconus, you're about to flip that coin. Mm -hmm. And he said, and where do you think it's going to come in your fancy phase picture? I don't know. Figure on the trigger. It's leaking a little bit, and, and well, wait a second, I actually know quite a bit about where it's going to land. I've done experiments, I've done lots of experiments, and actually I know how high it is and how spread it is, and so F is my best guess for what the initial conditions are. And then the math that I develop says that F washes out. My specific choice of F doesn't matter as long as the mesh is getting finer and finer. Any Bayesian will come to the conclusion that it's, that it's fair if the flip is vigorous, if I'm out, out there in left, left field, right field, actually. Um, so F washes out giving a subjectivist version of objective chance. Uh, that's just one example. Change of subject. <laughs> this is not a question that you hear asked in public so often. <laughs> you know, you're 
a bunch of grown-ups, and there I am talking to you about flipping a coin and other things like that. Does any of it matter to people? Could it matter in the world? I mean, could, could, so. Well, there are a lot of answers to that question, and uh, let me begin with maybe a quite practical one. <laughs> Uh, there's the world, uh, no, so what do I mean, does it matter? I mean, does thinking carefully about randomness matter? That is, could it, could it change your life or let you make money or anything or, or protect you from bad things? Um, so a lot of people used to play, it's now the FBI stepped in a, a couple of months ago, it's not so easy to do, used to play online poker. And I promise you, they don't have people sitting there shuffling cards in the Bahamas. What they have is some silly computer chip that generates random orders of a deck of cards. And, and it's nothing like actually shuffling cards. And some computer science guys and poker players and people like me, ouch, um, uh, figured out that you could crack the random number generator. So, to give you an idea of how it goes, the number of arrangements of a deck of cards is a big number. It's more than the number of particles in the universe. Uh, so it's 52 factorial, 52 times 51 times down to 2 down to 1. It's a big number. It's 10 to the 67th, about 10 to the 68th. Um, if, okay, random number generators, the way the computer works, are limited by the size of the computer. They, they are limited the, the way they, they work. And, and they're a much smaller number, 10 to the ninth about. But the way the random number generators are turned on, they use a starting seed. And if you know the random number generator and you know the starting seed, you know what all of the numbers are and you know the order of the deck of cards. The way the random number generators are started is to use the number of milliseconds since the start of the day. Well, these people knew when the computers were open, so they had a pretty good guess at how many milliseconds they were, you know, within, okay, some factor. And um, so that was that many possibilities. When the dust settled, the actual number of arrangements that could happen in a deck of cards were about 2,000. And so what happened was the, the deck is dealt out, this is Hold'em, which is a variant of poker, and when I see my two cards and the flop goes down, three other cards, I know everybody's cards. Well, you can play pretty well if you know what everybody <laughs> else's hand is. So this is a group of guys that by thinking about, hey, these things aren't really random and I can think about it, went and made money. They made money for a year and a half, <laughs> um, millions of dollars. Uh, and the way it came out was you can't just, I always win. You have to have somebody, you know, taking down the money. And so it might be I talked to Ed and said, Ed, I've got an opportunity. Nothing, you know, I'm just going to tell you what to do. But you sign on and then, you know, you play. I'll tell you how to play. Sorry. And, uh, and, and what happened is some guy who was being told exactly what the cards were and exactly how to bet decided he was an ace and he wanted half the money. And they said, give me a break. He said, well, if you don't give me half the money, I'm going to you know, go public with this. And he went public with it. And so that's why we know about it. Anyway, the point is real you know, casino operations can be thought about. Now, if that's a little flippant to you, here's one that's you know, hundreds of millions of dollars bigger, uh, the stock market. Uh, in practice, it said on the New York Times, the fo stock formulas weren't perfect. I'll read a little bit of it. Move ahead to August 2007 and beyond when markets swooned on doubts about subprime mortgages. Stocks that the model predicted were bound to go up went sharply down and vice versa. Events that were supposed to happen only once in 10,000 years happened three days in a row. So there are these phonies, they really are phony, who claim they can make equations and it's like physics out of the stock market and somehow they convince people that their equations were were valid and, and, and they were crazy and, and, uh, and it matters. I mean, at least in this way, it, it mattered. If you don't like that, it's about money after all, but um, th that is mm, people try to use probability in ways in which aren't, they're not sensible. Here are some other examples of, of probability calculations that give me the willies. Um, 
from mouse to man, well, this is the world of big models, um, do you ever wonder how they set carbon monoxide levels or you know, other, you know, how much sugar should be in something or other? Well, one way is they have these very, very spe specially bred laboratory mice. If you breathe on them, they fall over. And they expose them to thousands of times more carbon monoxide than anybody would ever use or see. And, and, and they see how they do. And then they try to extrapolate from those experiments to the rest of the world, to us, to other things. In order to extrapolate, you need a formula. And those formulas are, to a large extent, completely made up out of whole cloth. Now, I'm a professional. I looked hard. They're just somebody makes them up. We know we can do the experiments. You can't extrapolate from mice to rats. You know, it's a very expensive experiment to, to do, but they've been done. The, 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 the functions are not standard exponential functions. It's very complicated. So I'm just telling you that. The reference there, a paper by David Friedman and Hans Eisel um, in statistical science, is somebody saying it very clearly, and then the lab scientists coming back and saying, well, we, you know, so and so, and they duke it out. And I, you know, suggest you look sometime, but it's an example of, I think, silly use of probability modeling in the context of, of, of big models. There's another one that I put up, and there are, there are many, many examples of this sort, and that's census adjustment. You know, we just had a census a couple of years ago, and, um, and one of the things that happens, they try to count everybody in the US, and one of the things that happens when they take a census is they miss some people. And it's not trivial, it's five to seven percent, it's, you know, tens of millions of people, are, and mostly they miss people in big cities. You know, people don't want to be counted, illegal aliens don't want to be counted, sure, okay. The numbers are big enough so that it can make a difference on whether you get, you know, four representatives or three representatives, on, on how much money the, your state gets. I mean, they're huge, diff huge differences uh, uh, for resources that have to do with, uh, with the census. Uh, and how do they adjust? Well, it's a long story, and I'm not going to try to tell it in any detail, but to some extent, they make up a bunch of equations, and they try it. You know, and they say, well, it works pretty well, and other guys say it doesn't work. I'm of the school that thinks it's really all made up and that they don't know what they're talking about. And, and I'm not alone. I mean, there are lots of us that feel that way. If you wanted to read, again, one of these, let's duke it out, I'll tell you what I'm doing, and you say, this census adjustment um, is, uh, is uh, that's a paper by David Friedman and many other commentators. Statistics has a funny tradition. It has uh, discussion journals in which somebody writes an article and then people who don't like it you know, get to respond and then you get to respond back. And it's pretty, you know, <laughs> pretty tough. They're interesting conversations. But the point is this. Statistics has been taken over by um, huge models, models that are, that are so big that no one person knows what the ingredients are, models that are so big that if you try to run them again on the same data, you always get different answers because of tiny little rounding differences and things like that. Models where the input comes from other big models and the output is coefficients in some regression e equation which can't be compared with reality. And they've taken over. Okay, so it makes me very, very nervous. And that's my field, statistics. And it's just really every place. And, and now if you see the difficulty that I can have with flipping a coin, you could just imagine the difficulty I have with a regression equation that has thousands of parameters in it and is linearity and constant variances and all of that stuff. Um, uh, now, doctors don't testify against other doctors. And statisticians aren't supposed to say bad things about statistics. But this stuff stinks. Sorry, <laughs> uh, c colleagues. And, uh, and you all heard me. And you have to make up your own mind. but something to beware of. Now, that's a lot of negative stuff. And I don't want to end on a lot of negative stuff. So I have to remind you and me that um, probability can be used for the greater good. <laughs> so there's one more example. And here it comes. Um, and and uh, this is, uh, this is a, a story, but it's a true story. Um, it's the story of Gauss, one of the greatest mathematicians ever, ever, ever. 
and Ceres. Ceres is the largest asteroid. And um, uh, the, the time is 1801. And Gauss, who really is a brilliant man, has just finished his masterpiece, Disquisionis Arithmetica. He's 21 years old. Uh, and um, it, it comes out. Uh, and uh, then he realizes he's got to get a job and uh, what to do about that. At that time, the world was sure, because Hegel had argued, that there were only five planets. Right? Everybody knew. And, um, and then some guy spotted Ceres. Okay? And he followed it for about 40 days. And he, how high above it, uh, of the horizon is it? How far over is it? So he had some measurements. And then he lost it in the sun. And this wasn't some thing of some astronomer in a corner. This was on the front pages, you know, is there another planet that circles the world or not? That's pretty interesting. People really were excited by it. Except they couldn't find it. And the best mathematicians and astronomers and physicists tried to find Ceres. They had the preliminary data, and they, they couldn't find, uh, they couldn't use the data. A guy published the data in a newspaper. He was so frustrated by it. And Gauss saw this data and he said, wait a second, maybe I can figure out where Ceres is by thinking about it. Okay. Now, let me explain a little bit. Uh, Ceres is orbiting, going around. For anything that's orbiting that way, if you knew where it was at some time and you knew how fast it was going, so that's three coordinates of position, three coordinates of velocity, if you knew where it was and how fast it was going, you would know where, it's go where, where it is for all time. So the unknowns are only six numbers. You know, at some time, where it is and wh where is it going. The observational data that Gauss had were, you know, he was, the astronomers were here. So how far above the horizon is it on the first day, on the second day, on the third day? How high, you know, how high up is it? How far over it was it? They were certain functions of those six parameters. And of course, you don't observe it perfectly, even with a telescope. You observe it with error. And that's what that sentence says. That is, the ith observation was some function of these unknown parameters plus a little error. Yi might be the height or the angle on a given day. And epsilon i is noise. Okay. Gauss had the idea, justified it, that, so I've got to figure out these six parameters, the elements of the orbit. Gauss had the idea, I, I know the form of the function, and I don't know these thetas, but I could try to choose the thetas so that the form of the function at that theta differs from my observation by as small amount as possible. So he took the observation, he took what it should be if theta was the true state of nature, and he took the difference, squared it, added that up over all of his observations. That's called the squares. And he had to figure that out. And as he writes, I'm quoting now, um, October 1801, the first clear night when the planet was sought by Zach, as directed by the numbers I deduced, restored the fugitive to observation. <laughs> OK, charming. <coughs> what did he actually do? This doesn't go on forever, but I'm putting one slide up of what Gauss actually did. The first thing he, he had to do was he had to figure out what the equations were. They weren't so well understood. It was sort of annoying trigonometry in three, you know, three spherical coordinates. It was, it was pretty hard work. That's one thing he did. He had the idea of taking that unknown rule, fi of theta, and linearizing it. He set the problem up as we do in our day-to-day -day statistics work. There's observations, these y's that I observe, and that's x, some matrix, plus a vector beta, beta the differences of theta from an initial guess. And then, so he, he formulated the problem that way, plus an error, uh, because for the observations, because he knew the form of the function, that matrix x had a known form. He invented Gaussian elimination, as it's now called, uh, to solve for beta. He used this beta to give a second guess. He had a first guess theta naught. He linearized around it. He then corrected it. He iterated, and he thus invented nonlinear least squares. He proved that his estimate beta hat was the best linear unbiased estimator. He proved that various other things. He was Gauss. I mean, he was just amazing. <laughs> I was complaining about the use of models. In this example, 
there were many, many assumptions made. The planets don't go in circles, you know, there's this rather complicated motion. We, Gauss assumed that the errors were from the bell-shaped curve. That's completely made up. Uh, he assumed that the equations were linear, that y was a linear function of the thetas, uh, at least initially. He assumed that the measurement error didn't depend on the day, which it might, if the sun's shining or not, or whether it's this kind of measurement or that kind of measurement. He assumed that the measurement error was constant, and he assumed no bias. Those are all wrong, wrong, wrong. <laughs> Nonetheless, Gauss found series, right? <laughs> and where others failed, and it's still where he says it is, right? He just said it's going to go in this orbit, and you can look now. And what the other thing that happened is it's now officially a planet. And, you, know, you know, when Pluto got demoted, Ceres, got, Ceres is now one of the planets. So uh, that's just a few years ago. Gauss didn't know about that. Um, an unfortunate thing happened um, is uh, he got a job as an astronomer. And so he stopped doing mathematics, at least full time. Uh, this is an example of good probability model, modeling, skillful statistical analysis to do a job that the smartest people couldn't do without it. It's one clear example. It's the first example of, of, of this kind of analysis. There are thousands of other applications. Um, uh, uh, as Feynman says again and again, advances of this kind, tools of this kind, can be used well or badly. And Feynman says it very well. I won't try to use it. I told you they can be used badly in you know, mouse to man and census adjustment and many, many other misuses of statistics. They can also be used well. And uh, here's my last slide. Conclusions. I talked about flipping a coin, a dart, dice, roulette. I didn't tell you about shuffling cards, but I, I could have. <laughs> um, in case after case, randomness or good analyses are possible. But often, this species, us, are lazy. And we don't flip the coin vigorously enough. We don't shuffle the cards enough. We don't brush our teeth enough. Okay, uh, We're lazy. And things can be pretty bad. And it's not only in theory they can be pretty bad. You can go make money in the casino based on the fact that they don't roll the roulette wheels right. People make money in the market and lose fortunes by using bad models. OK, that's one conclusion. This is a quote from my friend Amos Tversky. Um, it's easy to lie with statistics. It's good to remember it's a whole lot easier to lie without them. Why I gave this talk, especially aimed at the freshmen here, is the following sentence. Randomness isn't a black box. It isn't a black box. We can and must look inside to make responsible use of probability theory. Whatever you do, you're going to encounter somebody using some analyses. And you're allowed to think, is that true? Is it reasonable? You don't have to figure it out yourself. Remember, there are people like us who can help you. We're happy to help you. And, uh, um, but, but, but you can think about things, and you should, you should be skeptical, because there just are endless charlatans out there. There really, there really are. OK, this talk was called The Search for Randomness. I think you could tell by now it's been my search for randomness. Thank you for coming along with me. Thank you.